As you know, we want to orient our church around how do we make disciples. Now that's a very religious church word, so we've tried to make it more meaningful and we've said a disciple is someone who is in the process of learning and growing to deepen their relationship with God, for that relationship with God to saturate every area of their life and for that to overflow into the world, the situations, the people around them. And a way of measuring how we are doing at discipleship is to look at how secure we are in different areas of our life. So we've said, how secure are we with our relationship with God? How are we secure that God is bringing good news into our life? How secure are we in the church and our acceptance and ability to be part of the family there? How secure are we in our everyday life to know that God is with us and helping us in all areas of our life, not just the religious ones? And finally, how secure are we in sharing our faith, in being motivated and doing things to make the world a better place and to affect other people's lives because of our faith? And so at the moment, what we're doing is we're working through these different securities. We're looking in the Bible to teach ourselves uh, and inform ourselves so that we might grow in, in being more secure in those areas. So we've just been looking at how much God loves us, how it's something we don't earn, that he just showers on us, he lavishes us with it. And we're now moving into the next area of security about being secure in the good news. Now the Bible's word for good news is gospel. And so sometimes we can think again, this is a religious technical word. You know, we might think it's those four symbols. Sometimes it becomes very individual. It's about us getting our ticket into heaven. But actually God's good news is broader, wider, more comprehensive than that. And we want to talk about that in this series. And we are specifically going to look at the fulfillment, the ultimate good news that God has for us is the rescue and the recreation of the whole universe. So we are going to be looking at the age to come. idea the age to come is the foundation of all of our good news because it means that whatever good God does in our lives and whatever struggles we might have in our lives they are all overwhelmed by the goodness of what the future holds for us so we're looking at what it is what does heaven mean now that's a difficult word because even in the bible it means different things it can mean the universe and the stars and, and the galaxies it can also mean the dwelling place of God and we tend to use it as a place we'll go to when we die. And there's a lot of confusion about that. There are a lot of ideas that have come from popular culture and medieval thinking that actually doesn't have an awful lot to do with the Bible. So what I want to do is think about the age to come, you know, or glory or heaven, whatever we want to call it. What is our ultimate eternal destiny? Throughout history and still in some parts of the world, People have understood their lives as being part of a bigger story. There is a bigger idea about what's going on in the world that they find their life within. So for thousands and thousands of years, it would have been a religious understanding. And then there were other things, there were other movements that people felt their lives fitted in, whether that might be, you know, post-war, the global spread of communism to, to solve the world, or opposing it, the global spread of market-based democracy to push against that. And then in the uh, 80s, 90s, with the fall of the Soviet Union and that, that conflict kind of coming to an end, sociologists talk about us moving into a different uh, kind of time where we'd move from the modern time into a postmodern time. And people in the West especially lost this sense of a bigger story. And so that's why I think now we see people trying to understand the meaning of their life and validating their existence in really things that you have now, whether that is their belongings, their, their possessions, their house, how nice their house is, their career, any kind of like ways of, of finding success becomes really important because there isn't a sense that there is something else, something bigger than just what we might achieve in our everyday lives. 
Well, for us as Christians, the bigger story is really important. And it is that strength, that good news, the bigger story is good news, that means things like what we own and how good we do at our careers and how many people we date and how many likes we get on Instagram, all those things don't have the same power for us because they do not define us, they do not validate us, they are not the purpose or the meaning of our life, there is something bigger. So it's really important that we understand this bigger story because it does empower us to live life in a bigger way. So today, what I wanna do is go through that bigger story to help us understand how our individual, relatively short lives fit into this big picture and give us purpose, meaning, and great joy. And so to tell the story, I'm gonna use the ancient theological prop of Neapolitan ice cream. Because of course, without Neapolitan ice creams, the universe would never make sense. So we need to start at the very beginning. At the very beginning, there was nothing just God. And I want you to imagine that this table is nothing, which is hard to do because a table is something and we need to use our brains to imagine it and our brains are something. But in the beginning, there was nothing just God. And so sometimes that question, well, who made God or where did God come from or what came before God? It doesn't really make sense because there was just God. There wasn't even before, now or future. Time didn't even exist. And the Bible says that God created the universe, the time-space universe, which we are representing with this white bit of paper. And so the universe has time, which we are going to imagine marches forward from your left to right. So God creates the universe. He creates the time-space universe out of nothing. So in the beginning, God created the universe, the time-space universe, and he creates it perfect. We read about this in Genesis 1 and 2, and God creates the universe that is wonderful, and everything is perfect, and we will represent that by chocolate ice cream, because Let's face it, chocolate ice cream is the best. So when God creates the universe in Genesis 1 and 2, we're told that it's perfect, but it is unfinished. So when he creates people in his own image, he tells them your job is to go into creation and bring order and beauty. And so that is what's set to do for us humans to enjoy creation, to enjoy bringing, working, to bring order and beauty into the universe that God has created. But the Bible tells us, as we piece the story from other places in the Bible, that there was an angel called Lucifer, who instead of worshiping God, felt jealous and thought, I would like to be worshiped myself. I'm not sure why I am giving my worship to God. And so he rebels from God and he goes to humans and he tempts them to not trust God. He, he, the, the original sin is this not trusting. Instead of thinking that God is good, maybe God is not so good. Maybe he's withholding something from you. So people choose to believe this lie, to give in to this temptation. And what happens then is what theologians call the fall and the universe is broken, which we will symbolize with vanilla ice cream, because let's face it, Vanilla is pretty boring. Okay, this uh, is not as neat as I was hoping. I was expecting this to be a perfect, you know, like continuation. I don't even understand why the vanilla 
is thinner than the chocolate. I don't know how that's happened. So when the universe is broken, after the fall, we find ourselves in this vanilla universe. All the lovely perfection has been taken out and instead it is broken. But immediately there is a promise that God is going to restore the universe to the way he intended. He is going to fix this mess. He's going to repair it. So we have this promise in the future of the universe being fixed at some point in the future. So a way to understand this is to think of these two, the chocolate. God's presence is saturating creation. God is present, fully present in creation. But in this time of brokenness, God has withdrawn. God has withdrawn. And the reason he's done that is an act of mercy. So if you imagine the fall, the fall is sin which brings death and decay into the universe. And it's like a disease that has riddled creation, that has, that has saturated all of creation. And so God, who is the antidote to that disease, God is life itself. If God was to fully come into creation like before, everything would get destroyed, everything would get burnt up because God and our fallen universe are the polar opposites. God is completely holy, perfect, the source, the, the definition of life itself. And the universe currently isn't like that and could not take that level of God's goodness to come in. So God has withdrawn somewhat. Now the universe still runs, we still have goodness. The Bible talks about the rain and the sun coming. God's goodness is still present, but God has had to withdraw. And that's why in the Bible you often see, God says, no one can see my face and live. And people are getting like glimpses of God because that's the best we can take. Another way perhaps to think about these uh, is about who's in charge. And so if God is in charge, if God is king, then we have perfection because God is the only one really capable and qualified to be in charge of the universe. But what's happened here is we have said, actually, we don't want God to be in charge. We want to be in charge. We want to make our own decisions. We don't want to have to think about what God thinks is best. We want to do what we think are best. And so God's kingdom is not reigning now. And this is the mess we see. This is the mess we see in the newspaper and perhaps you're feeling it especially now with all that's going on. This is the mess we see in our relationships and other people around us. And it's the mess we see in ourselves because God is not in charge. And in fact, I think so many of the ills of the world boil down to control and power. People wanting control and power, whether that is in our, our personal relationships with other people, whether it's in our workplaces, whether it's in our local areas or in our governments, or even when we get to the world. Even when we get to uh, you know, these multinational corporations or these governments and armies, it's about who has control, who has power. Well, at the moment, God doesn't, and so it's a complete mess. So the Bible tells us that this is going to be restored, but for most of the Bible, no one has any idea how it's going to happen. And there's all these talks about God's kingdom coming back because a king is going to come and take it. And so then we read in the Bible that Jesus arrives. And the best way to understand Jesus is like this. Jesus is like a bit of the age to come dropping right into the middle. That we, we had the, the age of creation, we have our current age, the age to come, and a bit of the age of, to come lands in the middle. And so people think this is a king to restore the kingdom. And so you'll see in lots of times in the gospel, people are talking to Jesus about, are you going to raise an army? Are you going to drive out the Romans? Are you going to do all these things? But Jesus is a different sort of king. And the best way to understand what Jesus did is to think about the age to come. So the miracles Jesus performed and even the teaching he gave, these weren't magic tricks. They weren't superpowers that somehow proved who he was. They, it was the age to come breaking in to the current age. So healings, there is no sickness in the age to come. People being raised from the dead, there is no death in the age to come. People being provided with food, there is no 
need, there is no scarcity in the age to come, there is abundance. People being drawn back into community, back into relationships, there is harmony and love in the age to come. So all these things, all these miracles and the things Jesus did, which he interestingly did in his everyday life, you know, it was around the table, it was as he was walking around towns, as it was traveling from one town to another, very few of it happened in religious settings. It wasn't something that was confined, it was embracing and abundant. These things he did are like tasters, they're like movie trailers of the age to come. So instead of being a king who came and conquered, what Jesus did is he submitted obedience to God and sacrificed himself. He went to the cross and took all of that death and decay, all of the things that made the current age, our current age, rubbish and imperfect. He took all of the sin, the shame, the brokenness onto himself at the cross. So a good way to understand the crucifixion is actually the judgment, the judgment that people knew was coming to sort out the broken current age and make us ready for the age to come. That judgment that was going to be terrible for the brokenness of the universe, that came on Jesus. Judgment came early. The, the sky was darkened. God turned his face away from Jesus. Judgment came on Jesus early and then he offers that that process of having already passed through judgment to us. And then Pentecost happens and people receive the Holy Spirit. Now remember we talked about one way of defining these different ages is how present God is. And God had to withdraw from the current age. Well suddenly, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, because he's taken our rubbish from us, we, for God to be with us will not destroy us. He has done that so we are able to have God with us. And the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. Suddenly God isn't withdrawn. He becomes incredibly present. He becomes dwelling within, inside us. And so what we start to see is the age to come starts to work its way into the current age through the church, through believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so if you have been around Vineyard for a while, we often talk about the kingdom of God is now, but not yet. And that's what this means, that it's not, not yet, the age to come will come in fullness, but it is now because it's starting to break in through the Holy Spirit in our lives. The now and the not yet, a little bit like my facial hair, you know, I'm almost 50, this is the best I can do. It's not yet, but there is something here. There's a little bit. So it's that foretaste of facial hair or the kingdom of God. So the church historically has tended to fall on one of two extremes. There's either the people who focus on the age to come and say, heaven is gonna be wonderful, can't wait for heaven. So I'm gonna bury my head in the sand. I'm just gonna hunker down and just survive and ignore what's going on in the world because one day Jesus will rescue me and everything will be made right. And then there are people who focus on the current age and say, we need to fix this. We need to use our power to fix it. And what they tend to do is they resort to whatever they can do to think that they're fixing it. But of course we are still broken people working in a broken world. So wherever we turn from politics to even to like military and violence and force to try and fix the world ends up just reinforcing the problems. God is gonna fix the world. He will ultimately do it. And he is starting to do it now by his spirit dwelling in his people. And this means we are kingdom people. We exist in this time. We are people who bring the presence of God in ourselves to people and situations around us. We find his power to work for the, towards the recreation of the world, but we don't have the responsibility of trying to make it happen. We get to make a difference in the here and now because of God's power coming from the perfection in the age to come, breaking in through us. So over the next few weeks, we are gonna learn about the age to come. We are gonna learn that we are not going to be floating on clouds. We are not disembodied spirits. We do not become angels. We are not ending up 
in a eternal church service. We can have such rubbish views of what the age to come would be like. We are aiming towards, we are heading for the most perfect environment to be fully human. It encourages us and it empowers us. It's like, have you ever booked a holiday or you know a holiday's coming and you just find that you have more strength, more joy to get through the everyday because that is waiting for you. Well, this is like the ultimate expression of that. Now, in some ways, the age to come is a bit of a mystery. In some ways, it's bigger and more amazing than our imaginations can cope with. But the Bible does give us more information than we probably realise. So if you're interested in finding more about what heaven might actually be like, what clues we get in the Bible, then I want to recommend one book to you called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Now, he goes through in detail some of the things that the Bible tells about the future, including like some stuff that perhaps we haven't thought about just because we haven't really thought it through. So for example, he's got this section, what will we do in heaven? And then he says, will there be entertainment and sports? Um, will we design crafts, technologies, and new modes of travel? We tend to think of heaven being so spiritual that actually we think that all these gifts God has given us are, somehow will become irrelevant, but of course they won't. I mean, he even talks about the vastness of the universe and says, why has God created such a vast universe if there's not gonna be opportunity for us in eternity to explore it? It's really exciting. But in our series, we're not gonna look so much at that. What I wanna look at are the values, desires, principles, things that are going on in our lives now that are actually in us, but are made for the age to come. And I wanna talk about how those things will encourage us as we live our lives to, to realize that we can look forward to and be empowered by the age to come. And so another book I really want to recommend is C.S. Lewis, The Great Divorce. Now, this book isn't actually about heaven. It's an allegorical novel that is set in almost like the foothills of the age to come. And actually the book is really about how do we choose God instead of choosing ourselves in all the different ways, the ways that might seem counterintuitive that we choose ourselves instead of choosing God. But what this does do is it sparks, I think, the imagination into what, what the age to come might be like. Because the age to come is gonna be this perfect physical universe, but it's gonna be just so much more, with no decay and no break, brokenness. So I just wanted to read a quick description from this. So he talks about souls or people going uh, on this process of, go of going into uh, the age to come. And these souls that are on their process meet people who are already there. And it says this, um, at first, my attention was caught by my fellow passengers. I gasped when I saw them. Now that they were in the light, they were transparent, fully transparent when they stood between me and it, smudgy and imperfectly opaque when they stood in the shadow of some tree. They were, in fact, ghosts, man-shaped stains on the brightness of the air. One could attend to them or ignore them at will, as you do with dirt on a window pane. I noticed that the grass did not bend under their feet. Even the dewdrops were not disturbed. Then some readjustment of the mind or some focusing of my eyes took place and I saw the whole phenomenon the other way round. The men were as they had always had been, as all the men I had known had been perhaps. It was the light, the grass, the trees that were different, made of some different substance, so much solider than things in our country that men were ghosts by comparison. It's this idea that eternity, that the age to come, life will be so much more vivid and abundant and real that what we think of as beauty now is a pale comparison. What we think of as a wonderful tree, if we could see that tree as it was meant to be, would just blow us away. So all these things are really exciting as we move forward. And so this week, what I want us to do is reflect on what it means to be kingdom people, to find ourselves in this big story, but to be part, to find our purpose, our meaning, because the age to come is present within us and has, 
has a desire to work out from us and change the world around us. So I want to have a moment now just to reflect, just to think about how we find ourselves, how we think of ourselves. Are we just living our life like everyone else in the world? Or can we start to, a bit like in that book, readjust the way we see things and realise that God's presence is within us? So I want to have a moment of reflection and then I'm going to end with a prayer. So let us pray. God, we want to be energised by the reality, the spiritual reality, the, the true story we find ourselves in. This world will tell us that all sorts of things are important. All sorts of things are where we find our meaning and our validity and our purpose. But you tell us we find it in the story, the story you are doing in the universe of, of recreating it. Lord, we want to be excited about what you have planned for us. We want to start to see our joys and our hardships in light of the brilliance and wonder of the age to come. So we pray you would be preparing our hearts, even this week, that we would be alert to the fact that you, the age to come, dwells inside us. And that makes a tremendous difference. In Jesus' name, Amen.